All right, I'm going to bring. I've <coughs> You get a glass of water, and um, I'm going to bring Kenton up to talk a little bit about the, the pre-approval and the approval process and some secrets. Okay. Thanks, Ken. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, here again, we want to dispel some of the mythology associated with getting a loan. So we're here to tell you kind of the truth of the way this thing really works. So first of all, there's certain criteria that we look at, and this is what I was alluding to a little bit earlier, which is income. Okay. The, the days of not having income, like, I'm putting 50% down, I don't have a job. It's like, hmm, great. Sorry. <clears throat> no. And there are certain situations that maybe that does make sense. Like if you were lending the money and you go, oh, yeah, well, they got $5 million in the bank. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, they're probably not going to be called on this mortgage. But the reality is, is the secondary market has no appetite for no income loans. And it's simply because they were abused. So typically we look at on a W-2 employee, okay? And this is where we'll do a free underwrite on the very beginning because it's important. Some people think that they've been pre-approved if they went on the internet or something like that. And then people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been pre-approved. <laughs> so, oh, well, they did that. Well, it's quickenloans.com out of South Jersey or Northern New Jersey, excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> but it was like... Uh, did they look at your income? Well, no, they just kind of told me it was in five minutes. Go, okay, <clears throat> okay, let's dig a little bit deeper. Or there are certain situations where somebody's income may be a base amount, and then we would look at a commission amount. Do they have a history of that? So there are certain things that we would navigate around, but typically somebody who's employed by somebody else would have W-2 income. And then we have a second category that we would look at is self-employed. This is a little bit more tricky because people will think, oh, I make uh, $150,000 a year on my tax returns, but then when we actually look at them, they got a really creative CPA, and they really made 10000 a year. <clears throat> and we go, oops, that's not going to qualify you for much of a loan. So um, the, the thing about being uh, going through a pre-underwriting thing, and typically what we'll do on the front end is say, Oh, if somebody fills out an application, the, the initial thing I have to say is like, okay, well, you say your income is that. Is that all base or is that, is that guaranteed or I get overtime? Well, is that overtime guaranteed? Well, do we have a history of it? So start looking at a two-year history of a lot of different things. The, with a self-employed individual, we'll typically get the most two recent years tax returns. And that helps us just determine. Now, there's certain things that we can add back in like depreciation and some paper losses and those kind of things. And that's where it gets a little bit creative sometimes. So Ken said here, the secret is to buy the home before you get self-employed. i got a guy I'm working with right now, 29 years in his line of work. He's got awesome credit. He's got plenty of assets. Uh, six months ago, he decided to go contract. Oh, that means he's paid by 1099. Oh, that means he's self-employed. Oh, that means you don't fit in the box. So nobody, when I went out and looked, I said, but he's a solid citizen. Yeah, I got it. But so I've actually found a banker who's willing to do this. You know, the guy we're talking about, you know, that says, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, and you're going to refinance him in a couple of years probably. So we'll do a five-year loan on that. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So there are certain ways to do that. So, but just bear in mind that there's certain documentation that we're going to look at. And when we verify income and look at that as a criteria. Second thing we look at is liabilities, okay? So uh, here again, there's a lot of mythology around this. <clears throat> so typically what we look at is what we call debt ratios. And debt ratios are, if you take all of your, if you take your proposed new house payment and you combine that with all other liabilities, and that could be credit card revolving debt, that could be a car payment that you have, it could be a student loan, it could be any liabilities that you have. So this is where this thing got really out of whack because for a while the, the, the machine that I'm talking about there, like I said, like I had a lady, she had a 10 over 30 days in the last 12 months on her mortgage being left. Like, whoa, an, an underwriter would never approve that. But the machine said, sure, we'll do that because she's got a big old nice retirement account. And I said, but, I said, well, the machine says it's okay. So I guess we're closing. <laughs> so I called her up a year later to do an annual client review because yeah, I didn't feel good about it, but we closed it, and then she's like in foreclosure. Did I help her? No, I didn't, you know. So then, uh, 
that's not right. So then what they said is, okay, if somebody's debt ratio, like all those things, is uh, 60 or 70 percent, the machine was approving these. And I was like going, well, how does that work in the real world? Like if you got 60 percent or 70 percent of your income is going toward your house and all debts, then how do you eat and live and go to the movies and, you know, all those different things that you don't think about because they're not in debt ratio, okay? So typically we look at a prudent way to look at this. So we don't want your liabilities and your house payment to exceed 45% of your gross or your net income if you're self-employed. There are certain cases, we see the automated underwriting machine that will do a 50%. I look at those with prudence, like do they have cash reserves? Or, and like if something bad happens in your life, is it gonna be okay? Because everybody knows Ultimately, there's going to be breakdowns that happen in all of our lives, and they're usually when we don't expect it. And so, like, do you have cash reserves? Or are you thinking about those things? And that gets into some fundamental stuff that they don't teach us in school, like budgeting. Hello? You know, like, hi, i got to be responsible for uh, my cash flow on a monthly basis. Oh, but I'm not good with math. They go, <laughs> you better get good with math, because you need to, because you need to take care of yourself. And the reality is, other the government is not going to take care of you when you get old, so you got to take care of yourself. So that's a completely different subject that we're talking about here. But we look at the prudence associated with that. How does this work in the real world in a cash flow situation? Okay. Now, if you know you're going to be needing a car, but you don't need a car, I had a lady one time. She went during the process. She went and bought a bunch of furniture and charged it up, and I'm like. Uh, <laughs> for her new home. I was like, uh, uh oh, you don't qualify for the home anymore. <laughs> so, and that's an unfortunate situation. So sometimes, you know, if you know you're going to be needing a car, here again, that comes to the equation, the real world stuff that doesn't show up on the machines or, uh, you know, the real cash flow things. And that's what we want to explore. Okay?